Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are discussing how the weapons business is making dramatic use of the war in Ukraine. Our guest, Niav Nivrian, is the war and pacification program coordinator at the Transnational Institute. She's in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. The Transnational Institute and Stop Waffenhandel have a new report out called Smokescreen, How States Are Using the War in Ukraine to Drive a New Arms Race. Niav Nivrian, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thank you very much, Dave. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for writing this report. Uh, why did you write it and, and what are some of your key findings? Yeah, so I suppose the idea with writing this report came from many months back in, I suppose, the first months of the first, really the first days and weeks of the of the outbreak of, of full scale war in Ukraine and at the end of February of this year. Um, uh, yeah, we were looking a lot at what the, uh, kind of statements that were coming out from European Union um, institutions, from European Union member states, from countries around Europe. Um, and we were seeing that there were constant uh, pledges of financial support for military aid that would be sent to Ukraine. And we we had we actually had in, at that point, we had in the pipeline a report called Fanning the Flames. Um, which we published together with the European Network Against the Arms Trade. And we had already in this report that came out in March, so it was already in the pipeline before the war kicked off. We had already in that report, uh, you know, substantial evidence to show that the European Union was, was becoming more militarized. There was more of an, an effort being put into spending money on weapons, uh, research and development of weapons. And, and so we already knew that Europe was along a militarized path. Um, and when the war kicked off, uh, we saw that there was a doubling down on on militarism. Whereas we, and our thinking was that we've already been militarizing for many, many years. NATO has never been so, uh, you know, armed to the teeth. Uh, you know, we've, we've got a situation where we're significantly overarmed and that militarism did not uh, deter Russia from illegally invading Ukraine. Um, and so we felt, OK, we need to monitor what's actually happening, because as well as the military spending and the pledges um, of more weapons to be sent to Ukraine and also to replenish uh, armies across Europe. On the back of the Ukraine war, we're seeing a lot of shifts around support for arms companies, be that through more access to public funding, more access to private funding. So basically what we're seeing is a, is a panorama that is shifting before our eyes and that there's very little critical research um, and analysis of what it means to arm our world in a way that we've never been arming before. Um, so that was kind of the driving focus of the report. Um, and yeah, I suppose the key findings really would would go along those lines of what I just outlined that, that we already live in a world where we are significantly overarmed. The CIPRI report for 2021 said that we're spending over two trillion uh, US dollars on, on military and we've never had uh, such high military expenditure before. Um, and yet we're in a world that seems increasingly more hostile. Um, and I think if we've learned any lessons from the Ukraine war, it's that militarism doesn't work. It didn't work to deter Russia. It hasn't, uh, it hasn't worked to stop Russia from continuing with its war in, in Ukraine. And it also won't get us out of, of the horrific, uh, the horrific uh, prospect of a nuclear war. Um, and we hope that we, of course, hope that 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 we will eventually see common sense and stop this before we we really get to that. You know, when, when we really see, have have that ahead of us. But um, yeah, so I think that the driving force behind this report was really that there has been very little critical thinking around militarism, um, and we wanted to to shed a light on that. 
when you say that all of these weapons increases did not work to deter Russia, some people, of course, would argue that putting so many weapons so close to Russia provoked Russia. Uh, but be that as it may, it seems that even before this big escalation of the war in Ukraine, Ukraine was a key argument uh, for building up uh, these weapons that you saw prior to February. And it seems in the U.S. we go through Democratic presidents saying, we love NATO, NATO needs to buy more weapons, to Republican presidents saying, ah, NATO's no good, they don't buy enough weapons, they need to buy more weapons, uh, and back to the Democrats. But either way, whether they love NATO or hate NATO, the, the demand is the exact same thing buy more weapons uh is, you know is this is this what how much has the u.s demand that european nations buy more weapons uh been driving their increases and how much is it i don't know public outcry <laughs> among europeans we need our governments to spend more on weapons i know indeed and i wrote a piece last week in the eu observer um where i asked when will enough be enough um, and I think it is a case of constantly driving this narrative that we need to defend ourselves, we need to protect ourselves. Um, and, and in the report that we mentioned, the smokescreen report, we actually pulled out some of the snippets of the, the conversations and the comments that we've had coming from European Union politicians where they make specific reference to the Russian threat. But then we, we pull out in a separate part of the report the statistics on how much Russia is spending on militarism and how much EU countries are spending on militarism. And it's four times greater what we're spending in the EU than what Russia is spending. And that's not to diminish in any way the horrific uh, devastation that and, and massive loss of life that, that Russia has inflicted on Ukraine. That's not to diminish that, but it's to point out that Russia uh, does not pose a significant military threat to, to European Union states because they're significantly overarmed and su su significantly more superior in terms of the caliber of the weaponry. And I think even military analysts will agree, and we've also mentioned this in our report, military analysts will agree that Russia's, um, Russia's capacity to lead in this war has, has, has been they've been struggling since the beginning. Um, and I think that, that their capacity militarily was vastly overestimated um, since since the beginning. So you know, on the one hand, you have um, war analysts saying that they vastly overestimated Russia's capacity on a military, militarily. But then on the other hand, you have them using Russia as the, the grounds for investing in more militarism. And, it, and it, yeah, it's like you say, and there's never a moment, whether it is, um, you mentioned in, in the US, the, the Republicans or de the Democrats. And what we've seen in, in Europe, we have a situation where Finland and Sweden, who were not NATO members and have now applied to join NATO on, on the back of the war, this is happening with social democrat governments so governments that are on paper left leaning um center left they're ushering in this this turn or this move towards militarism where uh, you know so it 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 almost doesn't matter what side of the political spectrum you're on because it seems that militarism is the only solution that's being put forward. And, and what we're doing is trying to challenge that and question that and ask, is militarism not, in fact, a fundamental part of the problem? And should we not be looking at ways to demilitarize, to de-escalate, to put back on the table the importance of diplomacy? And that's much better done before a war breaks out. When a war breaks out, then it's obviously much more difficult to stop it once it's started. And I think also in in us releasing this report now, and one of the one of the points, one of the key points that we have in it is also to say this is not just about Ukraine anymore. This is about driving a new arms race. An arms race, of course, will eventually need a war to justify this spending and this militarism. It needs a threat. Um, and so we've had a lot of, of criticism of peace movements, I think, since the war broke out, that pacifists don't bring any solutions. 
we're trying to bring the solutions now before the next war starts and already raise the question why are we why are we continuing down this path when we we can see as clear as day that this is not the solution it's it's a fundamental part of the problem this this over 2 trillion dollars on weapons that's that you say is unprecedented and never before does that include at the time of world war 2 I'm not sure how far back the CIPRI figures go. Um, I would have to check the date, but at least since all of the recent reporting that we've been doing, we rely a lot on CIPRI's figures because they're they're really thorough in, in how they access their, the data. And, and I think they're, yeah, they're very well recognized. And they have flagged this as the most, the, high, the highest amount of, of spending on, on militarism. I, I, I'm not sure how it compares in in terms with with World War II, but it's certainly it's certainly very significant if we think how would our world look? What would our world look like if we weren't spending two trillion dollars on yeah. the military, but on on yeah on, on on trying to build peace? There's a there's a terrific, uh, very informative uh, graphic uh, in your report. Two pie charts. One splitting up military spending into NATO, China, Russia, and others, and one into U.S., others, China, EU, and Russia. Uh, and Russia is a teeny little sliver in, in both of them. And NATO is, NATO is more than half uh, of military spending in the world. Yeah, when we used the CIPRI figures, I think it came to 17 times greater um so the the spending of nato was 17 times that of russia um and when we when we looked at individual countries or breakdowns it was the european union countries were spending four times more um and i think yeah when you see in the pie chart when you see how how the the numbers weigh up and you see the 3.2 that russia is spending compared to the, the 17 times that is what nato is spending um and also the capacity of the of the weaponry that we're seeing from NATO countries, also the, how highly sophisticated the weaponry is, and and I, and in the report that's why we've done that. We've com then coming following on from those pie charts, you have the texts of different European leaders, and, and included there is Joseph Borrell, who constantly makes reference to the threat posed by Russia, but when you when you actually see the amount of money that's being spent by Russia and the the weaponry that it's using, even military analysts will say that it doesn't pose a significant military threat is, to, is, to Europe or to NATO. Is that why NATO talks so much uh, in Europe about China, even though China isn't anywhere near Europe? Yeah, I mean, I think we all remember what kicked off in, with Taiwan and the Nancy Pelosi visit, and 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 this ruffling of feathers, and it's and and it seemed, you know, I mean, it, you 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 wonder what, why was it, you know, the, the the joining of the dots between what we're seeing now, this massive military build-up, even though Russia as we've seen in the report, doesn't pose the, the the significant military threat that it's being made out to. But then you also have saber rattling going on in, you know, in, in the South and East China Sea with the Taiwan situation. And you, yeah, you just, you wonder what, what, what where is this all leading us? And why, why is nobody putting the brakes on and calling for an es a de-escalation for a cooling off period? Um, and yeah, I mean, I'm I'm not an expert on China. I can't I can't really give give too much of an in depth analysis on it. But it it I think it begs more questions than answers when you see how we've been discussing China and and, and um, the military build up around the world. And and I suppose the way the way yeah the way that 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 this is shaping up that the world seems to be heading in the wrong direction um yeah you know i think i don't think we it, it you know the sense is that we're just constantly going in the wrong direction um and even just the question around the climate some another you know aspect of our work at tni has been looking at 
you know, joining the dots as well between militarism and, and climate catastrophe. And we know that the military is one of the most significant contributors to to climate and also, you know, the the security companies that are often pr protecting the fossil fuel companies are also part of this military security industrial complex. Um, and the massive amounts of money that are being moved. We we already know this is not the direction we should be going in, but political leadership is not doing what it should to 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 shift course and to move in a different direction. We're speaking with Neov Nivrian, who uh, whose report Smokescreen, how states are using the war in Ukraine to drive a new arms race. We'll have a link to it at talkworldradio.org. Um, the 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 increases in your report for the EU members of two hundred billion dollars in military spending, uh, that may be more than we've seen in the U.S. I don't know, but the U.S. it seems to be thirty forty billion dollars more each year, uh, and another eighty billion dollar increase. I think just since the, the your report came out, uh, and. That's not counting tens of billions, maybe a hundred billion dollars in free weapons sent to Ukraine uh, by the U.S. Um, so I don't know who's uh, <laughs> which side of the Atlantic is is increasing the the weapons spending the most. Yeah, I think I think in Europe. Um, I remember the day that the the um, announcement was made on. First of all, this, that Europe was going to send arms to Ukraine, the EU, um, through the European Peace Facility. So this is a new off-budget fund that has been created in the European Union structure to send, in this case, they're sending weapons to Ukraine, but it's also a fund that is enabled to send weapons to, you know, to, to countries experiencing war and armed conflict. It's Orwellian in that it's called a peace facility. Um, and I just saw um, before we came online and, and uh, well, this is being recorded in mid-December, so that there is more fun funding now going to be made available for the European Peace Facility. Um, I saw very quickly that it was going to be two billion more that will be made available. Um, this is an off-budget fund. Off, off, um, it is outside the usual European Union protocol on transparency, accountability and oversight. So this fund is um, circumventing the normal European Union procedure on on, on funding. Um, so they, and it's the first time that Europe, the European Union has set up a European peace facility. Um, this this discussion on the peace facility would would this we could have a whole other other discussion on the peace facility. So I won't get into it too much. But just to say the peace facility it was already in the pipeline and set up and established long before you, the, the Ukraine war. Um, but the, it has been used to channel funds to Ukraine. Um, and I remember the day when the, the statement was made and I, the same day that so that statement was made from Brussels and the same day um, Olaf Scholz stood in Berlin and said that Berlin, that Germany was going to make available one billion um, sorry, 100 billion in uh, in in funding, um, 100 billion, uh, and and I think that this, uh, yeah, this came on day four of the war, and so I think already there was a, instead of trying to pull back at that stage, there were constantly, you know, money being constantly uh, put on the table with the idea of militarism and defence. Um, and yeah, just this this sense that when when will enough be enough? Um, I think the vast majority of the European spending that we flagged in our report is from Germany. Um, and just to put in context, there was a discussion in Germany prior to that funding, where for COVID health workers, so people who had been really on the front lines and trying to you know, to save lives in the hospitals around Germany in healthcare settings, there had been an ongoing discussion to to be able to give healthcare workers a bonus in recognition of of the work they had done um, to, during two years of the pandemic, um, being on the front lines, and it, it was a long discussion. And eventually, 
um, I think it was 1 billion that was allocated for this um, fund in recognition of healthcare workers. And then if you put into context that you have the 1 billion and then the 100 billion um, for militarism, you you know, you you think after we've come through a pandemic when all of our lives were put at risk, and in particular, vulnerable people who may have, for whatever reason, been more vulnerable during COVID, and really needed to rely on healthcare, and we struggled to reward the healthcare workers that got us through this time of COVID, and then within a few days or weeks, we have given you know, a hundred times that amount to send weapons to a war zone. This, you know, the the, the, the logic just escapes me. The, where's the rationale? What what are we doing? What are we doing? It's, to, it's total madness. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry I get carried away, but I just think when you see what we need to protect ourselves, we need a functioning healthcare service, we need education, social care, all of these things. Um, and instead we're we're putting money into war, you know? Uh, Arundhati Roy, I think, once said that they don't manufacture the weapons for the wars. They manufacture the wars for the weapons. Uh, and it seems when it's a talk about healthcare or education or environment, there's always a consideration of what will it cost? What will be the benefits? But when it comes to something like war, I mean, this demand uh, from the United States, from NATO, that countries spend a particular percentage of their economy on weapons, what does that have to do with any calculation of what's useful, what's helpful, what's justified? Uh, why would it make sense that the richer you are, the more weapons you need? Uh, it seems to be quite openly with shamelessly uh, a requirement to buy as many weapons as you can as you can buy uh, regardless of what they're for yeah. it, does it does it make any sense no it's it's I mean this this NATO target of two percent of GDP um, it's completely arbitrary even for somebody who may be in favor favor of military spending two percent of GDP it's it's more political statement and, and symbolism about your dedication to NATO than it is based on any real need, even in military terms, to to be able to protect yourself um, or to de defend yourself. Um, and yeah, it's it's just another example. I think of 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 these numbers being thrown around um, when nobody's looking at the actual underlying causes, the root causes of why there's war in the first place and why we might need to even be discussing numbers. Um, yeah, what, what, how are we going to, how are we ever going to resolve anything by killing each other? I, I think we've learned that from, you know, from any, no war has come to an end through military victory or if it has the massive amount of lives that have been lost, you know, to bring a, bring a conflict to an end, you need to sit down and talk and negotiate, you're not going to resolve political differences by killing each other. I think yeah. we know that already. But it's, it seems that the provision of all of these endless free weapons without limits is, uh, is a motivation against negotiating, uh, at least from the Ukrainian side. Um, can they, is it, is it possible to maintain this position of unlimited free weapons for Ukraine uh, and more and more weapons for NATO, uh, but negotiate peace at the same time? Uh, or is there, a, is there a conflict there? I mean, I think that, that that's also what we're trying to look at is, is look at the people who are making profit. You know, there's, there's massive amounts of profit being made from war. Um, and even before, like I mentioned in, earlier in the discussion, the Fanning the Flames report, which, which we brought out together with the European Network Against the Arms Trade. And in Fanning the Flames, we look at how the European Defence Fund and the precursor funds were, were formed um, within the European Union. Um, and one of the interesting parts is that there was a group of personalities set up to advise the European Union, the European Commission, on how it should spend its money, um, looking around defence. Um, and on that group of personalities, nine of the 16 people on the group of personalities were representatives of arms companies. Um, and then once the funds were announced, the, they applied for the funding and 
uh, I mean, I'm not sure exactly what the figures are now, but when we wrote our report, they had, um, I think it was 31% of the money that had been given out had gone back to those same companies that were instrumental in setting up the fund in the first place. So it's like, I'll tell you how you need to spend your money. And once you decide to spend it that way, then I'll ask for it and you'll give it back to me. I mean, if that isn't a conflict of interest, it, you know, what is? Um, and and so we see that the arms companies are very cosy with, you know, European Union politicians, and they're involved in decision making at the highest level. They're spending a fortune on lobbying. They have the ear of people in the corridors of power, and they're making a fortune out of this war. I mean, if you if you look at the shares in the arms companies, they have gone through the roof. Um, and, yep. you know, and, and it's, I think when we look at, when we make a call for peace, I think we also need to look at what's driving war. And it's often, there are the political differences, but there are also people who have um, a vested interest financially in a war going ahead and, you know, and it, it's like coming back to the to what you said about our weapons being manufactured for wars or wars being manufactured for weapons. And this, you know, I think that we benefit a lot from really scrutinizing the power structures at play um, behind the scenes. And so we've a lot of framing around this is Putin's war and it is Vladimir Putin who called for the invasion and invaded, and that is absolutely beyond, uh, you know, and there, uh, there's no questioning of that. And the illegal invasion is is an illegal, uh, yeah, completely illegal, and there's nothing to justify in any shape or form that that invasion took place. But I think that behind the structures of war are people who are profiting, and we often have those far out of our minds, and we don't even question question those structures of power, I think. If we've got about one minute left, uh, you know, back in the 1930s, there was such shame in profiting from war and there were hearings and scandals. It seems to be a matter of open, shameless pride now. Is there is there any shame in, in Europe in profiting from war? And or if there's not, can we create it? Yeah. I mean, even when you look at the formation of the European Union, I can't remember the exact quote, but um, when we formed, first of all, the European Coal and Steel Community, which which came out of the ruins of, of World War Two. And one of the quotes um, or one of the lines in the treaty that was signed to bring about that was that would, war would become not just unthinkable, but materially impossible. And the idea was that former rival nations, so in this case, Germany, France, but some others also, would come together and pledge to never again be in a situation where they would be driving the kind of arms race that got us into World War II. Yeah. Um, but they didn't let Russia in the European Union. <laughs> yeah, and, and, I, and I think, well, you know, we've completely yeah. forgotten our history. And, and, and like you say, there is no light being shed on the people who are profiting from war. It's you it, actually beyond that, because it's also covered in our report, you have banks and you have the armed companies in cahoots to, ar to argue that, that in order to defend ourselves, in order to have a sustainable world, we need to be able to defend ourselves. And so we even have moves, and it sounds like I, this is really far-fetched, but it's actually not so far-fetched at all, that we're, we're arguing for in social taxonomy that we would actually consider arms companies to be part of the sustainability um, Sustain, sustainability fund that they would be able to access that on the grounds that we need madness is sustainability we to, need to have a safer world and to have a safer world we need the arms company so it, you, you have a distortion of the narrative like you can't even believe it's it, it is know. madness neov nivrian thank you for your work and for coming on talk world radio thank you very much david thank you for having me this is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace.
Peace is the way.